Welcome to this BioSera tutorial at SLAS 2024, which is titled Empowering the Full Spectrum of Integrated Lab Automation with Green Button Go Orchestrator. Now, in this tutorial, we're going to explore how laboratory automation can be transformative in how you go about scientific research. Lab automation uh, isn't a one size fits all, and there are a variety of solutions and challenges to be found. But if implemented successfully, the rewards can be great. Now, our main speakers in this tutorial, Kate, Casey and Eric, will present on their respective automation endeavours. They will give you a good feel for how you'd go about adopting automation, no matter the scale of your ambitions. But before that, I'm going to provide some insights on what I believe is necessary to be successful. Now, integration in the context of lab automation refers to the process of connecting various laboratory systems, devices and software to work together. It focuses on establishing communications and data sharing between different technological components within the lab environment. Now, integration in this sense has been around for a long time, you know, since laboratory automation started to appear in the 1980s. And during this time, it has naturally evolved from small setups around a fixed arm to much larger dedicated platforms with robots on a rail that can run high throughput screening, for example, through to modular automation with dockable carts. Newer technologies have appeared, making systems more accessible as a result. You know, take collaborative robots. You know, they've made systems far more approachable than the industrial robotic based platforms that we've used in the past. And the interfaces to facilitate integration have improved um, tremendously as well. We started with RS232 for serial communication, but the limited data transfer rates meant that when USB and Ethernet came along, we were better prepared to handle far larger data sets. And on top of that, software APIs have become much more prevalent and the growing use of standards you know, has provided the opportunity to not even have to concern ourselves with the, you know, the low level aspects of integration so that we can focus on other aspects such as good system design. So where are we today? Well, the scale of integration within a lab has never been more varied and broad. We have you know, manual activities being guided by digi digital SOPs. We have liquid handlers that can integrate with other systems and devices. We have small automated setups using a variety of transport technologies, including mobile robots. And we have fully automated work cells that are modular in nature. And integration now extends to integrating entire work cells together. Now, the brief history of integration that I started with highlights that integration is nothing new. But what is important is to realize that much of the technology or the way of architecting a system that originated many years ago still exists today. We are still building automation platforms with robots on rails so that when, you know, if you go and walk through any lab today, you're still going to see devices that still use serial communication. So what is the best way to go about this? You know, how should we approach adopting automation so it comes together harmoniously within your existing lab operations? And let's start by considering why we use automation. And it's simple. You know, we want to be able to do better science. Automation enhances reproducibility. It boosts quality and productivity. It ramps up efficiencies. And let's not forget, it makes our labs safer and it can support sustainability initiatives that many of us have. The aim is to blend both physical and digital automation to integrate and as a result, run our operations more efficiently and effectively. But why isn't everyone jumping on the automation bandwagon? Well, it's not without its challenges. You know, the total cost of implementation is high. There's integration complexities, the daunting task of managing a number of connections to a varied set of uh, software systems across the IT landscape is a challenge that shouldn't be underestimated. Historically, lab automation has not been robust enough to fully trust it to remain operational for long periods of time. There are skills gaps, meaning you, you, you can't use the technologies you envisaged. There is inflexibility, which makes adding new workflows not impossible and limited functionality, which means the science has to adapt to the automation, which tends to not work out. All of these hurdles can make labs hesitant to move away from traditional manual methods. But despite these challenges, there's a surge of interest in lab automation. There's never been a more exciting time to use or be involved in this field. AI machine learning has been the most talked about enabling technology over the last year or so. Large language models and some of the work done there has been nothing short of amazing. Yet 
what's also been impressive is the evolution of both physical and digital, digital automation. You know, take uh, X planar technologies, uh, which give us the ability to move uh, samples directly underneath uh, a liquid handler head, serverless computing, just to name but a few. All of these technologies are becoming increasingly entwined and having a strong relationship between physical and digital automation, AI, ML, and the world of big and you know, small data still is essential. This independence is a game changer as each technical stride forward enhances the others. And this leads to much more comprehensive and innovative solutions in lab automation that can only help accelerate scientific research. So how do we overcome these barriers? How can we ensure we're using the right available technologies? Well, the first thing is, is that we don't have to physically automate everything. It's increasingly desirable for people and automation to work together seamlessly. Now, of course, we want our data flow to be to be automated, ideally, but physically focus on what can have the biggest impact initially. And therefore, consider a pathway that is incremental, where you can frequently deliver value, gather feedback, what worked well, what didn't, and then plan for the next phase. Think about having decoupled services instead of one giant monolith. This supports the incremental pathway that I just mentioned and allows new functionality uh, to be added or removed far easier than if everything was tightly integrated as one large platform. This is actually okay, this approach, having one large platform, if you want to run the same automation day in, day out. And in fact, the performance can actually be better. But if you want to future proof or build your automation in phases, that decoupled approach is, is, is much better. Have a digital mindset. Consider data from both a producer and a consumer point of view. You know, what metadata do we need to understand this data down the line? Consider a no data left behind mentality. It's important to invest in talent, having the right skills to use automation, analytics, DevOps, you know, having access to experts in-house or perhaps outsourced of the native instrument software. This really ensures that you get the most out of your investment. A closer alignment with IT is, is preferable, working together to design on-prem and cloud-based architectures, you know, ensuring a good understanding of regulatory compliance and cyber security concerns. You know, having solutions that are secure, whether in cloud or on-prem or local, is more important than ever. And this calls, for, this calls for an increased level of collaboration. There's a growing enthusiasm for incorporating the DevOps culture into lab operations, the ability to automate and simplify deployments, you know, having a development, test, production environment. All of this allows us to streamline the way we work to improve quality and improve faster. And finally, Look to utilize instrument and data standards where feasible. There are plenty out there. There's OPC UA, there's CELA2, Allotro, and Animal to name but a few. You know, the use of standards provides a lot of benefits. It allows you to stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, essentially, uh, and build upon what's been done before. So you're not reinventing the wheel. Now, one of the ways I just mentioned of going about automation was to use decoupled services instead of one giant monolith. And this is possible for using orchestration. Now, orchestration goes beyond just integration. It enables your workflows to connect different instruments across your laboratory, regardless of whether they are standalone devices or part of a larger work cell. The key point is that the data flow is uninterrupted and the logical processing is independent of the physical locations of the devices. And this gives you the advantage of having separate processes in different places, but still enjoying the benefits of a connected, you know, integrated ecosystem where no data is left behind. Now, to do this, we start with automating discrete units. We break down our end-to-end -end workflow into units of operation, such as getting samples from a store or processing assay plates through an imager. So that these can be developed and tested in isolation from the entire system. And then with these units ready to go, we can orchestrate the full end-to-end -end workflow using any of these discrete units. Orders can be placed to execute any workflow that uses these discrete units in a way that is no different than if they were part of a much larger giant work cell. And in some ways, this holistic approach can actually simplify the experience for users. By adopting this two-tiered approach, you can have full end-to-end -end, uh, workflow automation, but in a manner that is not too daunting for you to both operate and maintain.
And this allows then for a scalable system that can grow and evolve with the changing demands of research without becoming unwieldy or overly complex. So how do we get ourselves ready for a future where we're using laboratory automation? Well, technology continues to evolve at unprecedented rates. It would be naive to believe this will not impact the field of laboratory automation, even if historically the field has lagged behind cutting edge advancements. There have been plenty of bad automation projects, but there have been good ones as well. But it's these past failures that provide us the opportunity to learn from mistakes and look to use new technologies and innovative solutions to find a better way. There are certain tools that we use every day that, you know, let's face it, are simple to use, such as Microsoft Outlook, Google Drive, Confluence. Seek this level of ease of use from your automation tools as well that are adaptable to work within a varied R&D environment and at the same time provide the reliability and robustness that you come to expect from, say, factory operations. Keep your automation strategy simple. Use the approach that orchestration facilitates. Be clear on the operations that will benefit most from, from your integrations. Work closely with your IT team. Consider the skills that are required for successful automation. Speak to people who have done this before and find out what skill sets they were most dependent upon. And finally, I encourage everyone to speak to other people, you know, other companies, other research groups, find out how they went about automation. By doing this, we have a great opportunity to accelerate research. We are witnessing a shift towards solutions that are not only user friendly, but also adaptable to the very um, R&D IT landscapes that exist and that provide tooling that is aligned with their expectations. It is essential for these solutions to seamlessly integrate with a multitude of services across different technologies, but equally critical is their reliability and robustness, which we have observed in manufacturing automation for years. Automation is becoming more common, and hopefully this uh, short presentation has provided you with some insights on how to go about it. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Kate Herringa. I am here from Scribe Therapeutics in Alameda, California. And I'm going to talk today about Ursula, which is our uh, automated work cell that we're using to take our next-gen sequencing program at Scribe to the next level. Uh, I'll go over who we are why we use automation, how we approach automation engineering in general, um, what our, pro uh, our requirements were for this specific work, fell, work cell, why we chose integration, and why, um, how partnering with Biocero uh, worked to help us build our first NGS work cell. Thank you. Um, Scribe is a CRISPR by design company, and what this means is that we engineer CRISPR-based therapeutics from start to finish, starting with genetic targets. Um, uh, we also engineered the CRISPR effector molecules and the transport vehicles uh, to take our CRISPR therapeutics to the correct organ or tissue system. Our technology is built on Nobel Prize winning science out of the Doudna and Savage Labs at UC Berkeley. Uh, and we are backed by world-class biotechnology investors, as you can see right here. So Scribe invests in state-of-the-art automation. Um, in order to, um, Scribe invests in state-of-the-art automation uh, to support our engineering and drug development programs. Um, today's talk, I'm going to talk I'm going to discuss how we use automation to support our gene editing outcomes pipeline. So in the past, before in the time before Scribe had invested in automation, we um, all of our processes were manual. We had no uh, integration, we had no orchestration. Um, each individual group at Scribe, from target discovery through development, pro, uh, performed all of their own sample prep. Um, and then for editing outcomes, would submit it directly to our sequencing core. Uh, this was fine when we had four employees. It is not fine when you have 80 employees. And so um, 
we having each group individually prep and then uh, submit their samples for sequencing led to a very high level of variability in sample prep quality because everyone's operating on different kits with different SOPs. Um, there was very inefficient sample tracking and in-process data collection. Uh, standards for data collection differed across groups. Experience with our in-house limbs dif differed across groups. Um, and this led to very long turnaround times. Um, and what I like to call uh, the data obstacle, really, which is the organization of data prior to and then extracting it from uh, the sequencing core, uh, making sure that as, what, uh, as you had to sort out noise from sample variability and uh, inconsistent data collection. So today I'm going to talk about how we centralized these core functions where instead of taking the final sample prep from each of these individual groups, we're able to collect the assay outputs themselves and then perform in our uh, sequencing core both uh, um, using our NGS work cell, uh, perform in a standardized manner the, both the sample prep and sequencing um, in sequence. Uh, our centralization within the Ursula work cell has led to much higher quality outputs because we had higher quality inputs. Automated sample tracking has allowed, given us more control and insight into um, our, our data, both through in-process QC and through standardized uh, sample tracking platform, and has led to a much faster turnaround time, which I will go into more detail. Our approach to automation at Scribe, um, I come from a process development background, and that's how I got into automation in the first place. And so our approach in, at Scribe is process first. So when we build automation, it is on the back of robust benchtop processes. Um, we also build sample conscious automation, meaning that all of our workflows are barcode in, barcode out, and they are integrated directly from our, they are integrated with our limbs so that we pull in data from our limbs in order to set up experiments and we push data out to our limbs at the end of the experiment. Um, our, our automated processes are built to scale both up and out, meaning that we, when we build, we build not for the capacity that we use right we need right now but for the capacity that we need 18 months from now or more and when we build automation we also think about what other assays are we running that are going to use the same or similar functions so that the next time that we need an integrated work cell we don't have to start from scratch um, and so the workflow that I'm going to talk about today is our Amplicon sequencing workflow. Uh, this is the engine that drives gene editing analysis at Scribe. Um, we use gene editing analysis both to test the efficacy of newly engineered CRISPR effector molecules as well as perform target identification and, uh, and uh, lead therapeutic development. Um, Amplicon sequencing begins with an assay. This may be um, application of a CRISPR molecule onto cells. It may be an in vivo experiment, but regardless, we are treating something with a CRISPR effector molecule, and then we want, us, we want to measure at the genomic level um, what the effect of that molecule was. Uh, so our Amp this, in this blue box right here, this is the piece of the puzzle that we have automated. Um, we're going to take either a tissue sample or a cell culture pellet, and we're going to extract genomic DNA from that using a magnetic bead-based purification system. Um, we then follow that with our first PCR reaction, which I will refer to from here on out as PCR1. Um, so when you hear me say PCR1, PCR2, <laughs> that's what I'm referring to. PCR1 amplifies the genomic region of interest. This is usually the site of editing. It may, however, be a um, suspected off-target editing site. Um, the, we follow PCR1 with a magnetic bead-based cleanup and follow that with PCR2 where we append indexing primers to our amplicon sequence that we can then submit for my seq analysis. Um, so I'm sorry, this is where my slides are out of order. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, so what does this workflow look like when we automate? Um, the, so we start with the sample submission. We're going to uh, 
right now, we perform genomic DNA extraction um, off deck from the work cell, so we have a separate automated system that does that. But then we take the ge genomic DNA as it comes off of the, we use the Kingfisher Apex to do magnetic bead-based purification of genomic DNA. Um, we take that genomic DNA off of the Apex and we first load the genomic DNA and the primers for uh, PCR1 onto the work cell. The work cell performs quantification and normalization of the genomic DNA and then um, assembles the PCR1 reaction by identifying the correct primers from the primer plates that we've loaded um, and associating that with the genomic DNA sample of interest. Um, we follow with off-deck thermal cycling and then um, return to the work cell for the bead cleanup of the PCR1 product. Uh, we follow with assembly of PCR2 with the addition of the indexing primers. And then once PCR2 comes off of the thermocycler, we bead clean up. We perform fragment analysis of PCR2 using the Agilent fragment an analyzer. And then from the fragment analysis data, once samples have been QC'd and have either been assigned pass-fail, we're able to normalize those PCR2 products and pool them for sequencing. Um, when we went and we were building this uh, automated workflow, our sequencing group um, had some specifics. They were like, we need to be able to process up to 20 different submitted genomic DNA plates at a time. So this is a maximum of 465 unique samples plus controls. Um, and we may have up to 25 primer plates. This is because we run this work cell for two reasons. One of them is to validate primers um, because anybody who's ever done PCR in the lab knows that some primers are better than others, um, and then also to do our analysis themselves, or, or analysis itself. Um, the output, they also said that the output had to be two different pools of PCR2 product, so it wasn't enough to just, you know, take everything and pool all of the passes. We needed to be able to sort of have two different levels of QC, um, uh, or, or sorry, two different levels of pools based on QC quality. And so why would we, um, so this process had uh, some specific requirements in terms of uh, instrumentation. Uh, the first is that we needed automated liquid handling. This is particularly uh, necessary in terms of the, nor like the two different normalization steps as well as the PCR assembly step. Um, we needed, if we were going to have automated liquid handling, we already had invested in the Hamilton Microlab Star platform that didn't have enough room for 20 <laughs> um, genomic DNA plates plus uh, 25 primer plates, so we needed plate handling. Um, we also uh, needed high throughput quantitation for our normalization uh, workflows and a magnetic bead-based purification system. Um, the magnetic bead-based purification system uses, um, you know, 96 well blocks of uh, uses 96 well deep well blocks as well as elution plates. We don't have room for tips and things. So we needed an automated media dispensing system that we could use to load our wash plates and elution plates. Um, and last but not least, our powerhouse of QC is the fragment analysis at the end of this process, and so we needed a fragment analyzer. Um, so why would we integrate as opposed to just buying all of these instruments separately and setting them up in a lab? Maybe we could just set up a lean process to, you know, walk plates from one to the other. Well, the first reason that integration was important to us is it allowed us parallel processing, which means that one plate comes off of the PCR1 assembly and goes to thermal cycling and we are, we keep moving. So it's, it's like having, um, Instead of having one technician walk a plate from your liquid handler over to the thermal cycler, uh, you are you are always moving through through the process. So we could, we were able to build a process through integration that would allow us to run up to five plates at a time with minimal human interaction. Um, the other reason why we wanted to integrate is that it gave us end-to-end -end data integration with our limbs. We can track where a sample is in the process at all times. We can also collect in process QC. Um, additionally, thinking towards the future and our building out strategy, um, we we uh, 
can do, integration allows parallel prep of multiple experiments from the same sample. So if I have a single tissue sample and I want to do gene editing analysis, but I'm also interested in phenotypic analysis, integration allows me to prep samples for both of those assays and run them side by side on the same sample, which presents a ton of cost and time savings. In addition, it reduces variability in tech, uh, be, variability because you have only one technical replicate. Um, so the results of integration are uh, increased capacity for our NGS uh, workflow, higher throughput, and fewer errors with better data capture. So our model predicted, or as we were designing, uh, this work cell, we were predicting that for five, like we measured that for 500 samples before integration, it would take almost four days for a single um, a technician to uh, go through 500, or to, to process and sample prep 500 samples, and at most they would be able to do two plates at a time consistently without errors. Um, you can see that workflow or on the top. However, with integration for 500 samples, it takes us less than 24 hours of active time, and we're able to do up to five plates at a time, which we could easily expand with additional housing um, on, on the work cell itself. Um, Forgive me. So uh, what does it take to build an integrated work cell? Well, we had to go out and find the proper instrumentation. Um, proper instrumentation for integration means that we have an API available and that there's a driver available either for our automated liquid handler or for our scheduling software. Um, any instrumentation also had to be automated, automation compatible, meaning that that has an either like automated doors or an accessible plate nest for a robotic arm. Um, also very important to me is I don't want to have any guesswork and I want instrumentation that I have either used myself before with success or that one of my trusted automation colleagues has used before with success. Um, the same goes for so scheduling software. I needed a scheduler to unite all of this instrumentation that I um, with a history of customer success. I have been using Green Button Go for 12 years, probably back to its first iteration, and I knew that this was the scheduler that I wanted to use. I didn't want to do any guesswork. I didn't want a learning curve. I just wanted to go with what I knew would work. Um, also, we needed dynamic scheduling, which uh, Green Button Go offers. Uh, Biosero offered us engineering support and programming of the software itself, which they did extensively through, um, both through the fra factory analysis uh, testing of the works, like the physical work style that we did at Hamilton, as well as site, uh, programming and site acceptance testing on site at Al in Alameda. Um, we also Ham, uh, the work cell itself, I, Hamilton did the physical build of the work cell itself. So we needed a scheduler, um, we needed a scheduling software from a partner that would be willing and able to work closely with Hamilton to complete the build, which Biosero um, was, uh, the engineers at Biosero know Hamilton instruments well, um, and so it was kind of a no-brainer. Um, so we went with Biosero. They have provided us with all of the project management to get the, the work cell launched. Um, they provided the base level scheduling software as well as the programming of the software. Um, they had drivers and sockets for all of the instruments that we were interested in. They performed the connections and integ like physical integration of all of the instruments with the Green Button Go. Um, like with both the, the computer that's running the Green Button Go software as well as the other instruments in the work cell itself. And as I mentioned before, they provided all of the method development and software programming and support. 
Um, so our results were, and I apologize for not having a picture of her, but it didn't get past my legal team. Um, the results were the, int our, the integrated Ursula work cell. So uh, BioCero is, or the BioCero GBG scheduler uh, helms a work cell that includes automated liquid handling for assembly of PCR reactions, magnetic bead purifications for genomic DNA extraction, and PCR purification, as well as fragment analysis for final QC of our PCR2 product. Um, it also integrates through our in-house data warehouse with our LIMS, and so that we have end-to-end -end, um, uh, sample tracking and in-process QC that we're able to collect. Um, and my favorite piece of data is that this work cell has about 32 gigs of operating RAM, so this is about four times the size of your average, you know, home PC in terms of processing power. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, uh, so um, again, I worked really hard to get this method past our legal department, but they're, they're allowing me to show this piece. Um, but this is the example of the method development that BioCero was willing to do for us, or sorry, not was willing to do, that BioCero <laughs> did for us. Um, and it starts with, can I, can you see the pointer? You can't, okay. Um, you start like, the, each of these columns represents a single individual workflow or, per, or process that the, um, that the, the software directs in order to um, assemble, both clean up the individual PCR1 products and assemble the PCR2 products. So we start with the first column on the left. We, um, the, the scheduling software directs the robotic arm to go into the housing and load the liquid handler with the PCR1 product. PCR1 pro the liquid handler then runs its method to add magnetic beads to the PCR1 product. Those are then um, added to the magnetic bead uh, based purification system, in this case the Kingfisher Apex. Um, Additionally, we are loading, we have to load labware out of the Lyconic at the same time. Our Lyconic is our, our labware housing onto the Kingfisher. Um, so we're, in these next two columns, what we're doing is loading, um, is loading both deep well wash blocks containing ethanol from the Lyconic housing onto the Kingfisher Apex, as well as the empty comb block that basically covers the magnet on the Kingfisher. Um, it then directs through by, uh, du the scheduling software then directs the Kingfisher Apex to perform the magnetic bead-based cleanup method. Um, and I will mention here that we had to develop this cleanup method in order to optimize purity at the end, and that BioCero was willing to work with us to help do that optimization and really make sure that we were getting high-quality PCR product out of the um, off of the Apex. It then follows by loading the plate back from the, um, the Kingfisher Apex to our automated liquid handler. And then we're able to uh, follow the, the, the last method from the end is where we're loading um, our primers for PCR2 out of the Lyconic onto the liquid handling, uh, onto our liquid handler, and then assembling PCR2 the PCR2 reaction on the liquid handler here in the sixth column. Um, so the results of this integration is that we took a method that was fully manual um, from start to finish from four and a half days of on hands time before it went on the sequencer to a um, a process that has less than 24 hours of actual active time, but one and a half days of, um, less than 24 hours of active time, but one and a half days of total time for to assemble the piece, uh, five plates of PCR2 reactions. Um, our capacity per technician went from 180 samples to 465 samples in a single run, and this resulted, and an additional benefit of this is that we saw significant reductions in the rework that we had to do um, due to manual, and, uh, man, manual errors and poor data handling. Um, and so with that, thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge the team at Scribe as well as um, at Hamilton and BioCero that helped uh, um, 
uh, that helped build the Ursula work cell, and uh, our excellent automation engineer, Shastine Keeney, who's here in the second row, um, is also uh, a, a critical force in launching Ursula. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Um, it's a good segue into my presentation. So uh, I work for Arpeggio Bioscience, and the title of my presentation today is Putting the Pieces Together. So um, Arpeggio's automated high-throughput transcriptomics platform. Um, happy, Kat, I'm happy that you guys named yours Ursula, because we're calling ours BMO. <laughs> and uh, just a little bit of lead speak there, because kind of nerdy. So all right. Um, yeah, so just jump right into it, who we are, what we do, how we do it, and then uh, get some key, acknowledge key acknowledgements at the end. Um, small little detail here, but I was really happy that we were really custom side paneling for it, so I just included that. Um, brief introduction about our team. Uh, we're established in 2018, small, tight-knit, but skilled and diversified team of 17 people. Uh, we do have some remote workers, but our headquarters is based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it's me laughing on the right there because uh, it's, automation is fun, usually. Um, so again, we're going to be doing high throughput transcriptomics, so just a couple little notes about the transcriptome. Um, without diving into too many details, the cell state is going to be a reflection of the transcriptome. So if you can measure the abundance of these transcripts, on a global scale, then you can have interrogations into the cell state. Uh, if you take two systems, perhaps healthy cells and disease cells, and you were to look at those transcriptomes, and then if you were to perturb those systems with a chemical moiety or a compound of some interest, you can then start drawing different connectivity maps and connections between these. So um, that's kind of what we do at Arpeggio. I'm not going to jump too much. I'm not going to jump too much further into connectivity mapping, um, but that's kind of the take home message here. And just know that we can get distinct transcriptomic signatures from perturbing these systems with different chemicals and referencing the different databases that we collect. Um, at Arpeggio, at our core, uh, we are a drug discovery company. Um, our workflow is going to be pretty standard on the right in terms of starting with a compound library. Um, seeding some cells. In this case, we're going to be working with cancer cells of different types. Um, we do dosing on automated acoustic dispensers. We have two echoes on our work cell. Uh, we'll incubate those cells. Uh, one of the RDS steps on the work cell like this is going to be how many cells can you dose, how fast, and how many can you incubate. Um, in this case, we're going to work with a uh, uh, high-res Stereostore D. I think it's got 336 capacitor plates. Um, from there, we have an arm that carries everything together and connects all these devices. Uh, we're using a Hamilton Vantage uh, for our automated NGS prep. Um, and then from there, we do deploy it to the cloud for data analysis and ultimately hit discovery. Um, back to the transcriptome. So when you are, what the goal of is uh, drugging a barren gene expression and interrogating the transcriptome, uh, traditionally, what you do is you would do a lot of RNA-seq, which would be a lot of samples. I don't know if everyone has done RNA-seq by hand, but every single one is going to require a lot of NGS prep. Um, and if we were to try to scale that, it would be pretty tough to scale. So I'm going to introduce a key technology that we're doing called Greta. Um, it gives us the ability to generate 25,000 transcriptomes in just one single experiment, and we find it to be faster, cheaper, and generate more data than RNA-seq. Um, the key here is Greta, so uh, something that we're very proud of at Arpeggio. Uh, it stands for the Global Reporter on Transcript Abundance. Uh, without getting into too much detail in here, the key here is that we are looking at mRNA transcripts, taking advantage of the polyadenylated tail and doing three prime bias uh, split pool barcoding se sequencing. Um, and if you kind of compare that to RNA-seq, uh, you don't have to sequence nearly as, nearly as depth. You don't have to have nearly as much sequencing depth comparative to RNA-seq. And the amount of samples that we're cranking out, um, we can do that in a fraction of the time relative to RNA-seq. 
Uh, I'm not going to go too far into this one, but this just pretty much shows a correlation between RNA-seq on the x-axis, transcripts per million, and our technology Greta, Global Reporter on Transcript Abundance. And you can see like a nice correlation here. Um, here I'm not going to talk too much about the science, but I just kind of wanted to the scale about the data that we're generating. Here this is going to represent if each dot is a gene, approximately 20,000 genes in the human uh, genome. Here we could, if we, on a larger scale, just imagine one of these dots being one transcriptome. Um, I'm not going to get into U mapping here, but here is just kind of, if you were to visualize all this data that we're generating on a 2D, 2D U map, each one of these dots would be one transcriptome. Um, going to go over this a little bit, but shown right here is just how you visualize 100,000 transcriptomes at once. Uh, this is just a small little data set that shows a screen with over 17,000 compounds across 21 cell lines and generated approximately 100,000 transcriptomes. Um, one more insight into the data of kind of like what this looks like. Um, when you're starting to drug against the transcriptome at a pressure, we discover drugs against cellular networks rather than specific targets. Um, I wanted to show this slide because doing high throughput chemo transcriptomics, as we call it, what does like all the data look like? Um, this is kind of what it looks like at the end, where on the left, you could see that in red is going to be upregulated mRNA. Blue is going to be down-regulated mRNA. Um, and then when you start looking at different signal transduction pathways, you can see that they start grouping in key transcriptomic signatures. Um, here you can see the PAX-A pathway, NERF-2 pathway, racetoglin pathway. It's just a way to visualize the data. Um, so this is just a small little uh, example set of some of the uh, transcriptomes that we're generating and how we kind of look at that data. But I'm an automation engineer, and um, how do we get about generating all of this data? <clears throat> um, so how do, we, how do we get there? So that was my job when I first came to Arpeggio. Um, if you've ever seen someone stand in front of an echo for like eight hours feeding it plates, it's really brutal, and I don't think humans were designed to do that. Um, I actually had a colleague, Carter, who was literally like sweating. He's like, humans were not meant to do this. I'm like, correct. So. Uh, we kind of did it in stages. Um, pretty much start with like, first thing consideration was like, start with the devices that you trust. Kat had a good point, like, everyone's kind of got their list of their favorite devices that are robust and you trust can do functions. So, um, already, we already knew what we, everything that we wanted. So the reason I call it putting the pieces together is, from the get-go, I have already established which devices that we we're going to use. Uh, we already had a Hamilton liquid handler. Um, we knew which incubator that we were going to use. And we just need different functions. So the key design here was, rather than design the arm that's going to be parallel to go onto the deck, just utilize the full length and tallness of the arm. So I call it the long and tall approach. And then integrate it orthogonally to your liquid handler so that you can connect to the maximum access, take advantage of the reach, and you can pretty much access as many devices as you possibly could, depending on your space limitations. Um, that's uh, shown right here is what our layout looks like on the BioSera work cell side. Um, real quick, let me check, make sure I'm... Eric, I want to leave you with enough time here. Okay, yeah. Um, so the automation capabilities and what, what we can do with this. Um, all the liquid handling is taken care of on the Vantage with self-consuming consumables via two entry exits. Um, it's a one-arm system with eight channels, a 384 uh, MPH and IPG, which is how you're going to move plates on and off the Vantage deck. Um, this is just going to take care of all the stuff that you're going to need for NGS, which is going to be your bead, pur your bead purifications, your SPE column prep, your normalizations, quantitation, anything that you need liquid handling for, will be handled on that. Um, in terms of the integrated devices, uh, we have the high-res trinity, as I'm calling it, the ambient store, the stereo store, and the tundra store. So ambi ambient storage, incubation, and freezing. Seal, spin, spin, seal, peel, spin, dose, read, wash, dispense, thermocycle. Um, those are some of the functions that we have with actually room to grow. Um, and one of the key things is simultaneous processing of up to three assays at once. So oftentimes that could be the same assay on different echoes, but we can dose and assay at the same time, as well as run auxiliary functions, like if someone needs to seal or um, treat some of their plates like at the same time. Um, 
And one thing I'm proud of is like, we can run this thing for like over 24 hours. I think we're gonna start getting to the point where we can run this for like 30, 36 hours regularly. So it's pretty commonplace for people to kick off runs on Friday afternoon and we'll come back in on Monday to just clean it up. Um, in terms of putting the pieces together, like I said previously, and how do we get to this point? Since we already knew what we wanted to integrate, um, we used BioSeo to pretty much rapidly put these together. So after we had finished our design with BioSeo and the things that we were going to put on, uh, we were able to get the arm and the table and the software all installed within three months. So from contacting them in October, we were actually screening by February. Um, here's me just laying out the tape on. They actually redid the floors right after that, so I redo that. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yeah, so let's jump into the automation. Um, that's kind of why we're here. So what does it all look like? Um, again, BMO. So this is kind of like the rear. Again, the, like the long and tall approach. Um, on the left picture there. So this is going to be if you're going to be looking in from the rear of the Vantage. Um, you can see the two echoes on the right. We have a couple sealers there. Five different thermocyclers. Underneath on that shelf, because it's, you could take advantage of how tall it is, uh, you'll have also a centrifuge down there, an XPL, uh, an EL406 as well. Um, the three different high res devices, and then like a Neo2 reader to do um, phenotypic screening as well. And then from the front, uh, that's the Vantage right there. The two entry exits on the right. There's actually an MPE not shown on the left, um, but it's kind of hard to take a picture and kind of put it all together, but that's kind of what it looks like at the end. Um, yeah, uh, but you might be asking, like, Casey, um, that's great, but what does it look like when the lights are off, and why is it not green, because it's green button go? Well, it's because our colors are fuchsia, and it also has the viz Q on there, so you can actually get the status light and customize it to whatever RGB color that you want for running. So here's one look in. Um, you can kind of see that the lights are glowing fuchsia. Uh, we installed some Nest Cams and we'll monitor this regularly. Uh, in the early days, we didn't have any email notification set up, so I would watch these way too long. But now we have email notifications, so if we need to go back and see if there was any error, we can have a clipping of that. Um, yeah, and the big reveal, we call it BMO, because I don't know if you guys know that, like, Cartoon has calculator from Adventure Time, but I used to watch that as a kid, so that's why we call it BMO. Um, and then I made a little gift for you guys because I was walking around in the lab in the middle of the night and uh, that is indeed what it looks like when it's running in the middle of the night. Uh, glowing fuchsia, just hoping that it doesn't go to yellow because that would mean there's an error. So, um, yeah, that's our work cell. And, uh, Big shout out to Jeff James, Grant, Alex, all this for setting it up. And also Steven, Darren, Alyssa, and John Canty for answering uh, all of our nice questions. Thank you. All right, uh, can everyone hear me all right? Great, well thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Eric, I've been working with Celino for the past couple of years. Uh, so Celino is a Cell, cell therapy manufacturing platform company. So we are we build a platform for manufacturing patient-specific IPSCs and doing that with our sort of proprietary laser cell editing technology driven by machine learning image analysis. And the goal of automating this type of manufacturing is to really bring down the costs of doing trials and doing research into cell therapies and to being able to process many samples in parallel, being able to run it in, sort of, you know, getting time away from humans. Uh, humans spend a lot of time processing IPSCs in manual culture, and so our goals are to automate as much of that as possible. And so building our platforms to do that internally, sort of from initially from a development perspective, we faced a list of challenges in well, the challenge set out before us was to run these cell maintenance processes over a long time period, run lots of them in parallel, run them through 
a number of instruments that we have that are, we have one or two of them, they're critical bottlenecks to the process, and so we have to really optimize how much they're being used. And then we're running many, many parallel processes that are overlapping with each other in unpredictable ways. They're changing day to day, and they need to constantly be able to respond to data that's being acquired in the course of, ma of maintaining the cells. And so some of the graphics here you can see there's a lot of what we're doing is image processing and, and like ML analysis to make inferences and generate predictions based on those images that we acquire. And then our laser cell editor can specifically remove or kill individual cells based on those predictions. So we're constantly in this loop of gather images, make predictions, edit, gather, edit, and running that process for up to 90 days. So our first approach was with GBG running a single work cell and trying to run a lot of these processes in parallel uh, with one instance of scheduler running all of it. That worked great in some ways, and then we started bumping into the limits of what a single instance of scheduler can really keep track of. So the things that it was really good at is optimizing the bottleneck instruments. Great at being robust. Error recovery is excellent for sort of within one work cell's sort of scope of errors. And we could do a lot sort of within the scope of a day of running lots of things sort of interleaved with each other. But where we started to sort of see it creep at the seams and where we needed to expand our ability to run these processes was when we wanted to run processes extending over more than a day and run lots of them, start new instances frequently, constantly have samples starting with different sets of steps laid out before them and different things that they needed to do. And so the way we ended up, at least our step back from there, so a step up a layer of abstraction and a way of thinking about how to run this is moving up from an instance of GBG scheduler to implementing Orchestrator around it, controlling all of these processes. So Orchestrator includes a number of other systems that interact with schedulers. We have Workflow Designer to design your workflows, Data Services, which is the connecting backend database, and really the, the glue that lets us pipe data and events and orders and everything around our system. And then Workflow Conductor is a UI, and Workflow, uh, well, and is the execution engine. So we have found a huge number of advantages from specifically the latest cloud-hosted version of Orchestrator in running these kinds of long-running processes. So at a base level, just the fact that Conductor, the primary user interface, is run in a browser and is accessible to anybody in the company from wherever they are. If they can VPN in, they can get it, which is awesome. And the error recovery is lovely for being able to handle things that come up during these processes. You get unexpected inputs, unexpected outputs, and being able to remotely see statuses and respond to those errors is a huge benefit. Data services also lets us integrate lots of our own and external data analysis and monitoring tooling. So we've built BI dashboards, business intelligence tool dashboards to collate data from our internal systems with data that's in data services. It's process data, experimental data, all sorts of things. And we get lots of different views of what's going on. I will say that the screenshots I'm throwing up here are meant to be tiny and illegible. They're supposed to kind of give a high level view of the kinds of things we can do without, in fact, being able to read any of the text. <laughs> and the other huge benefit of at least the latest version of Orchestrator is that we can host and deploy ourselves all of the component services in our own cloud infrastructure. That lets us use DevOps deployments and maintenance pipelines. It lets us scale also to just be able to respond quickly to a big process that all of a sudden needs a lot of resources and processing time. We don't even have to think about it. Kubernetes does that for us. So, um, and in order to, so, all right, I want to talk a little bit about how we actually do these long-running cell culture processes. So the processes we're running are, they're, you know, 
from a week up to 90 days of repeated media exchange, imaging, potentially laser cell editing, along with analysis of that image data that might feed back into instructions for the editing or instructions for what should happen later down the process. And so how we ended up using Orchestrator to coordinate these processes is, I really like the way Rob phrased this earlier, in the microservice architecture or thinking of the things that are available, like functions provided by systems in your lab as services. So we model our GBG work cell processes as services. We model things that humans can do in the lab, like reviewing data, moving samples, loading things into instruments as services. And we model data analysis, processing sort of limbs queries, image analysis as also services. And all of these then get represented as order templates in Orchestrator. So we can tie all of these steps together in Orchestrator workflows to coordinate the flow both of samples and data through our processes. This is a, uh, I wanted to show a diagram of how we actually connect all of the various systems that we have and what our deployment looks, looks like for getting to the place where these workflows actually work and are able to do, do things for us. So at the center, we have Orchestrator and its three key components. Then that's sort of sending, it, that's processing orders that are sent in by users. So users create orders. Orchestrator is running those workflows that are then sending orders to GBG work cells that can then execute these single atomic processes, return back data, as well as sending orders and getting events to and from our own internal limbs and data analysis systems. So back to representing everything as a service, to do an analysis, conductor running workflow just places an order to do that analysis. Our systems pick it up, do the analysis, and then respond with the results so that the central thing coordinating the process is orchestrator, but we've integrated human data analysis software, physical lab automation in the form of a GPG work cell, all coordinated together, both sort of across space and across time. You can also see in here that I represented again those user-facing tools. We've got those BI dashboards. We've got an internal web application that lets users review images and pass data, sort of make judgments, make instructions, and then those get interpreted by the workflows, and decisions are made based on those inputs then the workflow can choose a different execution path based on this in the loop. A method like human in the loop, sort of decision making based on the image analysis. Part of why Orchestrator is incredibly powerful for letting us do these kinds of processes is the modularity afforded by thinking of all of these processes as these atomic services. So the way that we can build workflows that are built up of these individual modular component processes and then rearrange, do branching logic within workflows. These workflows can in fact run for a very long time. So we, have, we run orders that run over multiple days, sort of create new instances of themselves or of other orders to run the next day's worth of work so that the configuration of what's going to happen in a run happens at the beginning and then you don't have to change any of that configuration ideally for up to 90 days. That the, the workflow has been set up with the logic ahead of time to make those changes and say, oh, it's day 12, I'm going to run a different media exchange. It's day 60, I'm going to start acquiring a different kind of images here. And this diagram here is also just to illustrate the, the ease of reconfiguring for new experimental processes. So one benefit of the modularity as well is that when a scientist d decides they want to try something new, they want to, in this case, try doing their media change after we acquire images because they want more flexibility and, uh, Rachel's smiling there, <laughs> want more flexibility in when they can run this during the day. It's as simple, but literally as simple as dragging and dropping these steps around in the workflow. Other than that, it's then just running a test. There's very little actual development work to accommodate these new experimental processes. So, in summary, like 
we have been tremendously successful with implementing orchestrators, specifically the latest cloud-hosted version. It's given us a number of really incredible benefits of being able to manage these long-running flexible processes that are constantly changing, integrating with our own internal data analysis systems, being scalable and providing all sorts of useful user interface and feedback. And so then I want to thank the wonderful team at Biocero. I realize I missed Rob on this one, but the orchestrator team, the GBG team, and David Demme gets to stay on here because orchestrator was his idea in the first place. <laughs> And then also our wonderful automation team at Salino. So we've got a number of those folks here, Jesse, Michael, and then others, uh, lovely scientific and software team as well. So thank you all for the time. Thanks for coming. And I think now we go to questions.